tell you, Nelly, uh, right there at that seat, 15 years ago to the day, 15 years ago to the day, we had one of our first CLE programs. Uh, Mary Keating was all part of that. And our special guest, our very first special sports notable guest, was a guy named Bob Suedos. Oh, dear. Bob Suedos <laughs> sat right there. He had just well, it's a uh, good seat, then. Yeah, it's a great seat. And he had a book out. Uh, and Council in the Crease. Council in the Crease. And I suspect somewhere you're all over that, or maybe had I actually had a hand in the drafting from time to time. So, just so everybody may not know who Bob Suedos was, give, give a little overview of, of him, because he certainly was, the, he so touched he was a lot the, of professional yeah, sports. He was, he was the, uh, um, sort of the silent enabler, I guess is what I would call him. And I'm thinking about him a lot this year as we talk about the 50th anniversary of Buffalo Sabres. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work for Seymour Nordy Knox, whom I hold in the highest esteem. Wonderful, wonderful philanthropist you know, in the Buffalo area. And uh, Bob Suedos was their very good friend and their attorney. And uh, Seymour and Nordy had the dream, and I like to say that Bob had the hard work to make it happen. And uh, the Sabres were as much a creature of his hard work as they were of the Knox's. So Bob was a visionary. I mean, he was, he was just a fantastic attorney. But as you know, his uh, role as a mentor was especially enabling because he envisioned attorneys as facilitators, not as obstructionists. So his marching orders to me as his, as his mentee were, we find a way to get the job done. The right way, but we find a way to get the job done. And that's what he did with the Building the Sabres. And then ultimately he became uh, outside counsel of the National Hockey League. And so I worked with him... Uh, uh, as a young attorney in both those areas, representing both the Sabres and the NHL. And the single most defining thing for me, and I just thought you should talk to your wife about this, was that Bob didn't care what you looked like, what your sex was, how old you were. If you could do the job and do it well, well, he would be happy to work with you. Now, he expressed his thoughts about your work at high volume um, on occasion, but it was non-discriminatory. Again, he didn't care who you were. Uh, uh, and and uh, I really, really, really appreciated the opportunity he gave me for him to offer a young woman in 1987, 88, the opportunity he did. I was the first woman, to my knowledge, ever to be president of an NHL Board of Governors meeting. It was phenomenal. And that was close on the heels of Jerry Meehan, another one of your guests, uh, who was also my mentor. I was at UB School of Law in the mid to late 80s, and a professor there mentioned the fact that Jerry of the UB Law grad, and suggested I contact him because she knew that I was interested in sports law. And so I reached out to Jerry, and again, Jerry, with absolutely no reason to do so, was kind enough to offer me the opportunity to do an independent study with him on dispute resolution in the NHL. So through Jerry's offices, I managed to speak to a number of people today, everybody from John Ziegler to Alan Eagleson, a number of people you might know uh, uh, across the leagues, former players as well. And as a result of that, I put together a, a paper that Jerry then shared with Bob Suedos, and from that I was hired by, by Bob. So you went to Harvard. You, uh, you got an AB in government, magna cum laude, and a thesis dealing with Roe versus Wade and the evolving struggle to define life. And your advisor was a, a little-known former U.S. Solic solicitor by the name of Archibald Cox. <laughs> Tell me about Archibald Cox. <sighs> A hero. Um, my very first class at Harvard was an undergraduate law class, and we're walking into Langdale North Middle, which is a big lecture hall, kind of a paper chase. And just kind of going, and I did that the entire semester. He was amazing and the kindest man. And I'm, again, thinking about him a lot this year because, as you mentioned, I, I did go to Harvard undergraduate. Um, I work on the Harvard uh, School Committee here in Western New York. I interview candidates for Harvard, and so of course the recent admissions case was of great interest to me because. The original case, uh, Baki versus the Regents of the University of California, was uh, argued by my, my uh, former advisor, Archibald Cox. So um, I had the temerity to ask. I went up to him and I, I asked, so if you don't people in the room, if you don't ask, you never get it, right? I tell my kids that all the time. So I actually went into his office one day and said, excuse me, I'm, you know, I'm in the government department, and I'd like to write a thesis on Roe versus Wade, and would you consider being my thesis advisor? And he goes, well, you know, I'm suffering from statutory senility because he was uh, 73, I think, and so he wasn't a full professor at Harvard anymore. And I said, 
I don't care. <laughs> and I had the ability then to meet with this legend, you know, at least twice a week for a year and a half. We stayed in touch afterwards. Uh, just a wonderful, wonderful man, the kind of person we need in government. Wait, did he talk about being caught up in the Midnight Massacre? Did, did he reveal his feelings about that? He was very um, principled but very frank. Um, I think it's fair to say he did not have much use for Richard Nixon. Um, and he was, I mean, his actions could have been predicted. He, he was principled. That's just who he was. And right was right and wrong was wrong. And that's, that's who he was. So you join with Cohen Suedos. You become part of Bob Suedos' uh, sphere at the NHL. Uh, not only with the Sabres, but the Board of Governors. And then you get caught up in something of which we've had three separate sessions on, dealing with Alexander Mogilny and uh, his uh, inducement to come to the United States. First with Bob Suedos, second time with Jerry Meehan, and third time with Don Luce. Now, oh, I know uh, CBC did a documentary, which copies of which were made available to our group when Jerry was here. Uh, you were, you're in it. You're part of it. Tell me your role in the Alexander Mogilny intrigue. Crash course in asylum law. <laughs> um, so anybody here in the room who I've known Bob Suedos, Bob, like a brilliant, brilliant lawyer, uh, and he was, uh, he lived law. He really enjoyed what he did. This is back for cell phones. Well, I think some people had them. Bob may have had one of the earliest ones. I think he did. I did not. I remember coming home from a trip to um, Atlanta. I was visiting my husband, who was a circuit court clerk down there at the time. And I came back to Buffalo in the snow in May. They had snowstorm. I arrived at the airport and said, oh, geez. Drive home in the snow. And I get home at midnight, and my phone is ringing off the wall, and it's Bob. We need to know everything we can about asylum ASAP. <laughs> got to get Donnie and, and Jerry home. OK, why? Well, they're, they're with Alexander McGillian. I, I knew who Alex was, but it, you know, as Jerry and I joke now, it was the best fifth round draft pick the NHL's ever seen, right? Uh, it was a brilliant move by Jerry, honestly. Um, so I did a crash course in asylum law, um, and uh, we hashed it out. There was about 36, 38 hours there where uh, we didn't sleep much. Uh, we reached out to a firm in D.C. that had some expertise in that matter. I flew down to D.C. and back. I think it was a, I'm going to say it was a Monday, I think it was a between Sunday and Tuesday, because the concern was we had Jerry, Don, and Alex over there, and we had the KGB circling. And, and I remember this very plaintive ball, phone call from Donnie at like 1 a.m. in the morning, Nelly, can I come home now? <laughs> i got to make sure I can get you in the door first, you know? Um, so it was a fascinating, fascinating time. And the one connection I did make as we were you know, talking today, and especially listening to that dynamic panel from the family court judges, was that, of course, they have something much different in the Soviet Union. That was the Soviet Union. And uh, what struck us as soon as he came over here was that he was a very different individual. His perspective, his priorities were very, very much couched by who he was and what he, how he had developed. And he was a preteen when his phenomenal hockey talent had been identified, and he was taken away from home. And he did not return again, uh, except for maybe one week a year. And so when ultimately he joined the Sabres and they offered to bring his mom and his sister over, they did, but he didn't really even know his mom. And it was a very sad sort of, sort of social, you know, uh, intuition to, to, to gain. When he came here, uh, by the way, by the way, I, I think Bob had mentioned that he had to get some congressional assistance, and the name Emil Houghton came yes. up. You, yes. Can you talk about how is it? He was involved. Yes. So, uh, asylum was at some, some of the discretionary matter at that point in time. The basis for his asylum petition was that. Uh, he was in essentially fear of, uh, of mortal danger. Had he gone back to the Soviet Union, because he was officially an officer in the Red, Soviet Red Army, the, all of these Soviet hockey players were Red Army uh, members, um, he was subject to essentially court-martial. Um, and he would have been sentenced to 20-some years hard labor in Siberia, which actually meant death. Um, and they would have made an example of him and his family. So um, the, it, the, the optics were challenging because, you know, it, we didn't want it to look like the Sabres were bringing over this high-end hockey player who lived a good life over there, relative to other people in the world at that point in time who were also applying for asylum. 
So in order to make that case, uh, we say uh, Seymour Nordy reached out to Emma Houghton, who then you know, relayed the facts of the case up through the line. So he was a player. Emma Houghton was, was in, the, in the play. Didn't but hurt that George Bush was the Yale <laughs> uh, At the same time, when he uh, came here, he was in, uh, in the States. I think he stayed with Don Lewis. Don Lewis, yeah. Well. And they, in turn, there was a great deal of concern about playing either Toronto or Montreal because of fear of extradition. Were you part of that? I was. And, and you know, again, part of the problem is Bill was 18, 19 years old. And for those of you in high school, I know it seems like it's a very mature age. But for somebody who'd been in that type of a situation whose every action had been so closely controlled for so long, you give him freedom and a car, and he's like, you know, so it wasn't just that. It was like he wanted to travel the world. And the whole thing about an asylum application is that you have to establish that you have nowhere else to go. So in addition to the extradition concern, there was concern that if you could leave the country, well, then really you could go someplace else. Just for, I'm not sure all the students might know, but why don't you give a little background, a little quick bio on Alexander Mogilny and the significance of that case. Because I'm thinking about it, we know at first, you know, kind of shorthanding it, but uh, just a little so background. So he, he was the first, after Parishnikov, he was the first significant defection from, from the Soviet bloc to the United States, and um, certainly one of the greatest hockey talents of all time. And of course, did Jerry get into that contract he signed with him? The, the, so, so, you know, you, you try to negotiate based upon how much you know about what the other side wants, and Jerry's like, he wants money, okay? Uh, when we first walked into the office, Jerry handed him, I think, something like $350 to, you know, tie them over. He goes, for Corvette, I'm like no, <laughs> Wegman's run. <laughs> okay, um, so so anyhow, it's a true story. So uh, anyhow, uh, uh, that 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 assembly year when his contract was up for negotiation, and Jerry's like, okay, Alex, tell you what, every goal you scored, it was twenty five hundred, it was twenty five hundred three thousand dollars, I think, over whatever the, the base was. Okay, you get that. Fine, that's the year he scores seventy six goals. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he buy like a, a, a million dollars? Wasn't that the signing bonus? Wasn't that something? There was a number in his mind which didn't necessarily bear a resemblance on anything other than it was a million. Yeah, he thought, well, again, he didn't have any sense of perspective. He just assumed he'd heard stories in the Soviet Union. You come over here and you become a millionaire automatically. I said, well, it doesn't quite work that way. But. So with the Sabres and during that time period, you, you worked with, the, with Bob and the Sabres up through when? What's your time table? So I started working at Cohen's Widows 86-ish, and I was there until 1994. And during that time period, I was working on um, almost, I won't say entirely, but I would say at least three quarters hockey, meaning the Sabres and NHL. During that period of time, the NHL also, was also expanding, so I was primarily responsible for multiple expansion teams. Um, and then following that, uh, we started building what's now Key Bank Center, and um, I went in-house with Bell. Where did house work? The Sabres. Sabres. So you're in house of the Sabres, and the ownership is the Knoxes still at that time? Yes. Were you still well with the Sabres when they transitioned or sold it? I was still with the Sabres during the sale to the Reeses. And then shortly thereafter, one of my children became quite ill. And um, actually, true story, um, uh, my, my, my son became very, very ill. And Mike Regas, uh, I was on, we didn't have much family leave back then. Um, I was on, on leave, whatever you want to call it. And Mike Regas uh, realized I hadn't been back to work and reached out and said, you know, anything you can do. And I told him what was going on. He said, well, my sister-in-law went to Harvard Medical School. Let me see. So he reached out to his sister-in-law down in Cottersville, Pennsylvania, and she made a connection with uh, the chief immunologist at Boston Children's and got me an appointment. And that saved my son's life. Uh, yeah. um, just a little Cowder's board moment in the Jackson Center. Uh, Cowdersport, Pennsylvania, the home of the Reguses yeah. and Adelphia Cable, uh, was also the last residence of Elliot Ness. Really? So and that's when what all I those know. who are senior like me remember the untouchables, that's Elliot Ness. Guess where he spent his last four years of his life working with, and an early investor was John Regas. No kidding. There you go. We digress. We totally digress. <laughs> uh, how did you then find yourself, I mean, with all that contract negotiations with the Sabres, then you kind of broaden your horizon and, and go off into, you know, uh, becoming an expert in a variety of, whether it's stadium site, whether it's 
women's Title IX stuff? So it's all connected, right? Um, I started off with what I, you know, had been doing, um, teaching the basic principles of sports law, which I learned from Bob Soyvis, um, and, and on the go, honestly. And sports law is a combination, amalgamation of a variety of different areas of law. So I've been practicing, I've been taking pieces of labor, uh, um, business practice, corporate, antitrust, immigration. We didn't do much criminal work, but occasionally came across, you know, an issue that required that type of, you know, expertise and putting it all together in a specific sphere. And what I, you know, great, one of the great things about Bob is a big picture guy. Um, and, and he was a teacher, he was a born teacher. And I was also very fortunate to have in that firm at that time, Bob Fleming, senior, who, um, wonderful man, taught me and I trust over coffee in the morning. And um, as, as a, you know, as a result of that perspective, uh, I always had this sort of broader view. It wasn't just about representing your client, it was in the greater scheme of things, what's going on. And so what I really appreciated about teaching, in addition to the interaction with the young people, was the opportunity to think about things in a more prospective fashion. You know, what can we do? How can we make things better? And as a woman athlete, as a woman attorney, and, and, and kudos by the way, just Judge Claire, I, you know, I really identified hearing, hearing you say, I can't see her, but um, hearing her say what it's like the only woman in, in, in the county, I wasn't the only woman in the county, it was an attorney, but I was certainly the only woman in the NHL. And I remember going to the NHL uh, offices in New York City the week before my daughter was born, and they could not get me out of there fast enough. <laughs> uh, but having the ability to use that platform to try to help. And, and right now we have a woman dean at the law school, which is phenomenal. And we've come full circle. So Jerry Mean is now working with me as special counsel at the center, which is just a dream come true because we're still very, very is close. Is he really? Yes, he is. Oh, yeah. Good. We came down here one time just to get CLE credit, so we should, you should have shown up today. There you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, Antonio Brown. Oh, yes. you're not in a, you're not directly involved, but nevertheless, his case, uh, whether it was contract negotiations, whether it's it's uh, alleged abuse, it but it's indicative of athletes and sports and yeah. I know you talk about that. So that that's the you know so that's the concern, right? Uh, is this just something that we're seeing, like so many other things, that's symptomatic of our society right now? That we're just it's more high profile in sports, or is it particular to a particular sport or a particular type of individual? Um, he's kind of a bad example, I think, because what we're seeing in real time. And I encourage you, if you haven't already, taken a look. We have a sports law blog called ublawsportsforum.com, and my students have been staying very closely connected to this and following the progression. And one of our students recognized that a lot of the very erratic behavior that Antonio Brown has displayed over the course of the last, I think it's 18 months or so, uh, follows a hit that he had to the head. And the, any of you who are NFL fans may recall the hit he took, it was very dramatic. He was sort of um, in a lateral position falling with no capacity to protect his back and neck at all. And the player came to the side and caught his head. I didn't see it. And then he fell. And so uh, there was some argument this summer that perhaps he was just a very, very um, skilled negotiator. And he actually reached out to a media consultant in, in uh, Oakland in the LA area trying to use erratic behavior as a way to get the Raiders to let him go. Um, and I'm not going to discount that entirely. It would be a great strategy uh, for someone in that position, I think, if they wanted to do that. But when you look at the other activities that he'd been involved in and some of the things he'd said, it just made no sense. There was no, it, they weren't self serving. They were just strange. And so the question becomes, are we seeing, you know, possibly a CTE case play out in real time? Talk about the sports personalities and its place in our society. Pop, call it pop culture, call it what you like. Uh, they have a platform. And is there any sense out there in law or uh, just policy-wise to sort of a assist these folks who all of a sudden have a microphone jammed in front of them, ask them what they think about the President of the United States, ask them about some sort of unrelated to what their sport is, and yet they have a platform is to infuse a little moral compass or something like that. How, is that part of what you might be doing in sports management to assist? Yes, absolutely. Like sure, so following Colin Kaepernick, we have had this huge debate, right? Um, and actually some of my students were involved in drafting policy at UB uh, to reflect what would be appropriate for student athletes in the event they decided they wanted to express some sort of opinion on something that may or may not be universally accepted. 
And of course, we're seeing it this week, right? Uh, with what's been playing out um, with the NBA, uh, and just I guess late yesterday with LeBron James. Um, if, you, if you hang on, I'm sure there'll be a post on me on my sports law blog very soon. It may be written by me. Um, but uh, a concern about you know the extent to which private employers may choose to restrict their employees, you know, conversation and, and, and freedom of expression. And of course, that that tweet uh, by the Dallas executive had. Um, dramatic impact upon the NBA, and now LeBron's saying maybe, that, maybe he shouldn't have said that, which I find um, disappointing, I guess. You and I were uh, at the Robert H. Jackson Federal Courthouse a year or so ago, and Colin Kaepernick was the uh, uh, focal point. You, did, you talked about him mm -hmm. and gave a, a compelling conversation about not only the freedom of speech, but also the collective bargaining, the employee rights, and why don't you just kind of give a little primer to these lawyers? <laughs> sure, so uh, the NFL, like the NBA, any other private private sports organization has the capacity uh, to set certain restrictions upon freedom of expression in the work environment by its employees. Now the problem, of course, is, as I mentioned, these athletes have a very broad platform. And so that, of course, gave rise to the huge debate within the NFL, uh, when which the president stirred the pot on several times. Um, and, and what we're interested in seeing now in, in the NBA situation is that the NBA historically has been extraordinarily proactive in supporting its players and being you know, uh, very loud in that space. And so now this is sort of coming back to bite them as they're having preseason games over in China. And, and it's just it's very disconcerting, I don't know if you know, but, but um, uh, the uh, Houston Rockets, which is the team uh, the uh, general manager had tweeted something in support of the Hong Kong protesters, they vanished overnight from the Chinese version of the internet. Just disappeared like they'd never been, which is kind of very bizarre for us to uh, kind of come to grips with. By the same token, there's a, a company called Blizzard Entertainment. Any kids here play Blizzard Entertainment? No? They, they, they have a number of online uh, video games that are very, very, very popular. But a large segment of their market is in China. So while the NBA stands to lose about 500 million, investment in China, and they're the, the league with the deepest you know, penetration there at the moment, um, Blizzard Entertainment might go belly up if China decides that they're not happy with their perspective. And one of their players in Hong Kong also expressed support in social media uh, for the Hong Kong protesters. So we're seeing some very interesting dialogue right now. And the very bizarre piece, because in this world everything is global, uh, is that we have uh, a tweet by someone um, in Houston, here in the U.S. soil, his expression of civil, you know, of, of freedom of expression is being in, is having an impact across the world, and a company in China is or China Chinese government is trying to impact his capacity to speak here, which is I'm not sure it's ever happened before quite that way. So the commissioner of the NBA, uh, is it Silver? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, try to draw a balance from he may not agree with the owner. Of Technically, his boss, one of his bosses, uh, participated, but nevertheless, he was going to defend his right for freedom of speech. What advice would you have given the commissioner before he made a public announcement, if different than that? Well, do you mean it, don't you? You know, I mean, if you're going to take that position, then stick with it. And um, the, the biggest challenge for any private association is you can't be arbitrary and capricious. So if you're to allow your employees to, you know, take a particular position and protect it, you can't then turn around and say, well, then you can't say this instead because we disagree with the content. What, a, what an odd situation where technically the commissioner does work for the owners. It's an interesting job, yes. yes. And Roger Goodell is in, technically employed by 30 owners. Yes, and that's, it, it, yes, it's, it's interesting. And as counsel to the league, you know, when we were working with the NHL, our, our client was the league all of those owners. So when we were working on expansion transactions, I would occasionally get phone calls from counsel to the another owner. Uh, I can remember one guy in particular who called 11 o'clock at night with comments. It's like, <laughs> please, <laughs> can we get the deal done? We'll worry the comments later. Yeah. California's governor just signed uh, legislation, essentially uh, and dealing with the NCAA. If they, if Pay-to-play, pay-to-play act. Uh, is 
is that just California being California? Or is this a harbinger of things to come? Well, it's amazing how many states jumped on the bandwagon as soon as that was signed. So that legislation was passed unanimously by both houses of the California legislature. Um, you may know that the uh, governor actually signed it on LeBron's show. Um, but within hours after that was passed by both houses, multiple states, and we actually have on our blog, we've got a map of the United States with showing which jurisdictions are aware of this at this point in the process. Multiple states also either announced an intention to introduce legislation or had legislation introduced. There's also a federal bill that's going to be introduced, uh, which all would supplement the, um, would supplement the uh, state legislation. Where's New York in all of this? About to introduce something. Where do you feel about this? How do you feel about this? I think the system is broken. I don't understand why the NCA has not pulled its head out of sand yet, quite honestly. Um, the optics are horrific. Uh, you have institutions that, you know, I love, I love sports. I love college sports. But you have institutions, not all of them, but some, that are making astronomical amounts of money. And you have student athletes who are going hungry, literally. And that's not okay. That's really not okay. And especially for women athletes, the peak of whose earning potential may very well occur in college because there aren't many professional opportunities, that's wrong. What advice, the NCAA, uh, obviously all of, the, all of the institutions belong to that. Uh, wh where do they go from there? Where, where does the college go? You got this legislation in California, you've got the institutions which are all members of the uh, NCAA, uh, Talk about the ultimate conflict for the general counsel for the uh, college sports department simply saying, now what do we do? So uh, the interesting thing about this is that California has a number of D1 schools, I think 22 or 23. So it is entirely conceivable that they could break away and form their own amateur athletic association. It's been argued perhaps the Pac-12 does that, or most of the Pac-12. Uh, because the NCAA has taken the position they will not allow them to compete for an NCAA championship. So if you are, you know, a star athlete, are you going to, you know, take the chance you won't be able to compete for an NCAA championship, but maybe go to California where you may be able to earn some endorsement revenue? Or do you say, I don't want to risk that and stay away from California? It will be a very interesting few recruiting seasons. Title IX, where does that stand now? It's been getting an awful lot of notoriety, and uh, certainly it's, it's had quite a, an interesting history. So that's the course of my career. Uh, when I was in high school, Title IX had just been, you know, been passed about uh, oh, eight years before that. And they weren't quite, quite sure what that meant. Everybody was afraid it meant that you know, girls and boys had to play all the same sports together. So they couldn't figure out what else to do with us in Batavia, New York, so they had us play co-ed volleyball the entire year, which was fine, we had fun. Um, that was the only sport they thought was okay to, you know, to do that with. Um, over the course of my career, I've seen you know, so many more opportunities for women athletes, it's fantastic. Um, I, I was a hockey player, an ice hockey player. Um, I will tell you that much as in law, we've seen some change, not enough, not fast enough. Uh, the girls still get the 6 a.m. ice before school, and the boys get the 4 p.m. ice after school, and don't get me started on it. Um, <laughs> uh, I tend to get more than a little bit upset. Um, I was appalled, but not amazed. Uh, I mean, you'll see reference to the materials, the event at Kent State a couple of weeks ago, there was, uh, it was the opening, I believe, of the football season at Kent State, and there was a women's field hockey game. Well, of course, field hockey in the United States is played almost exclusively by women. There's a women's field hockey game, D1 game going on, on a field. Overtime, double overtime, it was tied 0-0. And because they're about to start fireworks, daytime fireworks, for the football game, an hour and a half later, they kicked the women off the field. The game was called No Contest, it was a scrimmage. This is 2019 people. I'm sorry, this is unacceptable. And the um, uh, Kent State took 48 hours, massive amounts of pressure before they apologized. And then it was another two weeks, and they decided they really didn't have a Title IX violation there. And the only question is, can you ever imagine a football team being kicked off the field for a field hockey contest? And I think the answer everybody would say is no. We got a problem. <laughs> You received the Ken Joyce Award for Excellence in Teaching and Longstanding Service to the Law School. Ken Joyce spoke here probably three times, it's and it's the only, for those who went to UB Law School and uh, may have ever had Ken Joyce, he taught tax. 
He taught tax. Yeah. And for years and years and years, he won the award for the most favorite teacher. So give us your best Ken Joyce story, because he had a few of them. So, uh, I actually, I didn't have Ken. But you just won the award. I just won the award. I had Lou Delcado. Okay. And uh, I can give you Lou Delcado's story. Sure. So Lou Delcado, who was revered, he and Luke Ken were very, very good friends. Uh, Lou Delcado was a very imposing six foot two guy. And I remember sitting there, first semester of tax one, which required thinking on how to survive his class. And I made a mistake sitting like right at his eye level. So he honed in on me and was like, oh no. So the next semester I took tax two and I moved up. And he goes, where's Drew? <laughs> Stuck, you know. But uh, he was a, an amazing human being and, and Ken, of course, you know, just, just a, an icon at UB. So you're a full-time professor there. And you have this, uh, did you create the actual uh, uh, clinic there? That the center? Yes, it's, so yeah, actually, what, it, what it grew out of was 20 some years of teaching, and I kept finding that people in different disciplines were also in the sports space, and, and yeah, I invited them to speak. So I have um, a gentleman who's the Sabres and Bills team physician in to talk about medical malpractice from his perspective. And it's always interesting, you know, you learn something, right? Uh, people in the management school that have been involved. Um, public health, uh, they have a training program and the like. So it just seemed to make sense to draw upon the expertise in the various different disciplines and put them together so that our students coming out would have a better understanding of how the law applies in context as opposed to in a vacuum. And uh, developing programming that cross disciplines as well. You uh, presented recently a freedom of expression, the First Amendment in athletics. You were the moderator, organizer, speaker. Panel included Lorenzo Alexander, <coughs> NFL agent Shane Costa, Paul Cambria, uh, Lucinda Finley, and we, we've had Paul Cambria here, and, and as shy as he is, it was just... Uh, Dynamic speaker. Yeah, yeah, he's fantastic. Uh, again, back to, back to the point, we, we talked a little bit about is the freedom of expression and the ability of athletes to say or not say, and at the same time be employees of, uh, of, of, of their employer, the, uh, the team. Yeah, so it's a, an entering a new dialogue now here. Um, and of course, the interesting overlay of that is if you've got a student athlete, now what, right? Because they're not an employee, or are they? That's a question for you. Um, but uh, the extent to which you want to regulate that, and, and uh, we're very fortunate you'd be to have a very um, principled athletic department. And the administration's reaction was their students first. They're, they come here to learn, they come here to express ideas, that's how, that's how they learn, and we are not going to limit that. We're going to ask them to be respectful when they're wearing their, their gear. Uh, we're going to ask them to you know, talk to each other because people have different opinions inside a team, so that's part of the dialogue as well, right? Um, but, but we're not going to restrict their, their civil liberties because they happen to be playing for UB. Lorenzo Alexander, what did he bring to the table for my Oh, he's amazing. Um, I don't know if you know, he's also extremely active in the NFLPA. And I would not be surprised at some point to see him, you know, after his retirement, move into employment there. He's, he's phenomenal. We want him to come to law school, quite honestly. He's, he's, he's amazing. Um, but he had a very um, well-considered response because one of the questions that was asked, and it has been asked repeatedly, is how does this affect the locker room? You've got people from different backgrounds with different you know, opinions upon the presidential administration. Now, I don't know if you recall, but when this all came about about two years ago, I guess it is now, um, the bills were very, very uh, forthcoming. And they immediately held a meeting, this was well before the NFL and the NFLPA got together, they immediately held a meeting with team leadership, of which Lorenzo was one, and they said, we want to hear from you. How do you want to handle this? And they talked it through, so it wasn't like it was this information coming down from on high from the Pagula saying, you will not, you must not, a la Jerry Jones. It was, let's talk, let's have a conversation within the team and come to an agreement how we can be respectful about each other's opinions because there were people in the locker room who had different political you know, positions. And I thought that was incredibly instructive and honestly a model for what should be happening. A little personal story, my daughter is an attorney, former associate general counsel for the Detroit Tigers, then worked for RISE the Ross Institute for Social Equality, and part of what her job was to go to the bills as, as an attorney and to talk about permitting that uh, uh, moral compass, if you will, and bring that to the locker room. And Lorenzo Alexander was 
foremost in bringing her to the table. And th does RISE, is that, is that an institute which you're aware of, the Ross Institute? Yes, I am. And, and it was, I believe it's that institute that was brought to the table, I'm going to say November of that year, the NFL and the NFLPA met in New York. Now, there's a little bit of dis sort of dis discord within the NFLPA. Some of the players felt that it was a sellout um, to Kaepernick. Uh, but others felt very strongly it was a, a good first mutual effort. The NFLPA and the NFL agreed jointly to fund uh, community outreach efforts to address social justice issues, issues in each city, each market, as identified by the team members in that market. So for example, in Buffalo, Buffalo players chose the Buffalo City Schools as the forum within which they thought they could do the most good. Site selection. I see one of the things that you're well known for as the director of the UB Center for Advancement of Sport is stadium site selection and design issues. Are we going to have the Bills playing in downtown Buffalo? Oh, that's the question, right? How many people think they belong downtown? How many people think they belong in Orchard Park? So there's the question. Are there, there, are very, there are a lot of positives and minuses, depending which way you want to go. Uh, so we were talking earlier today about you know, environmental issues. Uh, first of all, it'd be a great super review. So we'll see which, which firm gets that one. Uh, secondly, um, uh, it's you know, a security issue, among other things. As you know, uh, we love our tailgating, right? Um, but the great thing about tailgating from a security perspective is that you can see it. They've got those great, what do you call those big pedestal things with the cameras you know, the, the, in the parking lots? It's, it's pretty much visible from the air. If you go downtown, where are, this, where are those tailgates and those parties going to go? There, you know, people will be in parking lots, they'll be in different venues. It's going to be much harder to kind of keep your arms wrapped around what's going on. So that's a concern. Um, depending upon where you put it, um, the infrastructure piece will be challenging. Uh, I'll give you an example. Back when we were building Key Bank Center, it was known as Crossroads. And there were two sites in play at that time that were, were serious sites. One was the one where it actually ended up. The other was the theater district, which did not then have the medical campus. And one of the reasons why we ended up going where we did was because it was kind of an industrial wasteland. So putting in the trunk lines and doing the environmental review for that area was going to be so much less cost, costly and so much more efficiently managed than going to the theater district where you'd be disrupting the existing neighborhoods, having to you know, disrupt the utility service for those areas, and, and just much, much more of a problem. So that's got to be part of the discussion as well. Now, do I understand the lure of a downtown development? Sure. Uh, anybody here been to Baltimore? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know where the football stadium is. So I've been there many times. You go down there though on a nice Sunday afternoon. You've got a significant chunk of waterfront that's just kind of walled off from the city, and it's not doing anything. So if we're going to put one, something like that downtown, we better think of multiple uses for it so that we're not just taking a chunk of downtown. Uh, full disclosure, Jim Sandora, who owns the Pierce Air Museum, is a good friend, and, and he's done a lot down there. I'd hate to see that effort and initiative you know, go to waste because of it, and then that's one, of course, one of the problems of action. So. so Terry calls you and say, what do you think, Nelly? What do you say? Well, maybe he has. He has <laughs> not. Um, boy, I'll tell you. I guess it's going to depend on what kind of facility you're going to put it in. If you're going to put it downtown, it's going to have to be one of those high-end, uh, I think, multiple-use facilities, and you've got to think really careful about placement. Scott Kinberg is right over there. Scott Kinberg is the sports editor for the Jamestown Post Journal. Covered the Bills and Sabres for a long period of time. Scott, you must have that question. You say, Greg, I hope you ask, Nellie, but so far not, you haven't done it. Well, you didn't allow me to ask. <laughs> okay, shoot for it. Um, I'm actually, my question you just asked was about the Bills and Sabres. Yeah. Um, venue itself is so, you're not that far removed from the field. I have a feeling that if you move to a different location, you're not going to have that intimacy, and that's the thing that, you know, if I'm a player, if you ask any of the players, they love them. Oh, that, and the phenomenon of that bowl, right? You all know where the bowl came from. It was left by the glaciers. So they, they put it, I mean, it, it was just the great thing about that location is you walk in and the field is below grade level because there was this hollow in the earth that they built it on. There's it's not a concrete foundation that the, the, well, there is concrete, but concrete is like resting on bedrock. 
and I'm told by the very reliable sources that if you go down there and look, it looks brand new because it's protected by the earth around it. So it's a really nice, ideal spot in that regard. I kind of hate to leave that. You were going to ask Scott whether uh, Nellie thinks Barry Bonds should be in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> whether the, 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 the so so I, I, I was a single-A ball player person first. My first team was the Tavia Trojans. Tavia Muck Dogs went to the playoffs this year, so that, that was great. Um, no, Bonds does not belong in the Hall of Fame. No. Don't. <laughs> Tavia Muck Dogs belonged in the, were in the New York Penn League when they played. The Still are. Yep. Yep. I was here many times for games, yes. Yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah. Jamestown's coming back with baseball. i got to put the plug in next year. Good stuff. Go. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, so what, what's the question you've been waiting for me to say? I mean, Scott, so far, has just thrown a softball at you. There's got to be a tough one that you'd want to like to answer. Let's see. Um, I guess we're, we're, you know, the big question for me is where the NCAA is going. Um, amateurism is a, an issue they have been trying to dodge. It actually has legal implications. The original coining of the phrase student athlete was done as an attempt to avoid workers' compensation, which tells you something about the motivation. And um, over the course of time, one of the great things about being a professor as opposed to being counsel for a club or, or, or a league is it's given me the ability to step back and take a look at it academically. And if you look at the way the NCAA's position in various lawsuits over time, particularly antitrust lawsuits, has been forged. It's been based upon this idea that it provides this sort of um, idealistic concept of amateur sports that may have at one time been somewhat true, but over time, less and less, at least at the FBS and uh, D1 women, men and women's basketball levels. And so you have decisions, cases that are turning upon Justice's perspectives of amateurism and collegiate sports, and that colors their view of how the law should be applied. And when you look at these cases over time and you juxtapose them against reality now, particularly the revenues now, I have a harder and harder and harder time with it. You are rooting for the Buffalo Sabres. Your family, which is huge, uh, are big hockey fans. Do you guys mm -hmm. go there all the time? We do go every so often. We do. Just for disclosure, I mean, you're an incredibly talented person, uh, scholar extraordinaire. Your husband's an attorney with Hodge and Lust. Uh, and you have how many children? Seven. Seven children. And when she pulls up, to uh, Ice Arena, there's a, the bus, right? There's a bus. What we drive an extended, well, yes, we have driven an extended van with four families. <laughs> so think about this sports van. So uh, We go across the bridge into Canada and it gets interesting. <laughs> 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 the smell of the hockey equipment usually comes <laughs> and we keep on going. <laughs> how, do you, how do you, just out of curiosity, we, we and I had three of them sports. We didn't know which way we're going, left, right, and different. So we would pass Seven. each other on Maple Road sometimes in the way to the rink, the two vans. Has <laughs> hockey been the sport of choice? Yeah, it's great because especially um, being based in Amherst for the most part, you could have all the kids play, you know, in the same place, not necessarily at the same time. But uh, some, most of the time the equipment worked. We have five, um, let's see, four, four D, one forward, and two goalies. But the two goalies were left and right. That didn't work real well. So, um, but some of the other equipment handled it, so it's nice time. All right, Judge Hartley's out there, and Judge Hartley, former family court judge, huge Sabres fan. He's got a, oh, there he's over there. And his, his question, I know, was give, me, give us your best, most humorous story about a Buffalo Sabres athlete, uh, probably in the process of negotiating some contract, or something that we may have known about. Or if you want to talk about Jerry Mann, okay. that's okay, too. So, so, um, True story. Uh, Jerry Nian and I were working on salary arbitrations, and the player elects to go to salary arbitration, and of course the club has to decide whether or not they're going to settle. And uh, one of the players was Rob Ray. Rob Ray. So we're going back and forth, back and forth, and you know what his point production was? Okay, pretty anemic. And, and it wasn't like he had a lot of ice time either. But it's like critical ice time, and Jerry's like, yeah, well, you know, we got to look at the statistics. And we, Craig Ramsey, 
um, who is uh, hockey, hockey uh, intelligence beyond, uh, you know, it's hard to describe. This is before the internet, people. And you know, other people would have to be like combing through books, you know, statistical books. And, and Craig just pulled out a pad and he knew the stuff. And Don moves the same way. And they're sitting there going, well, you know, you're looking at the, you're getting one statistic, what's that? Penalty minutes. And I'm like, oh, come on. And, and they came down to the fact that as an attorney, when you go into court, you know, you never go into any sort of dispute resolution without having some idea of what your downside's gonna be. We couldn't predict the downside because in any given night, Rob Ray would drop the gloves with anybody in the NHL. And we figured there maybe were three players that you could say that about, so we couldn't assign a dollar value to that attribute. And that was enough of a risk to say, okay, we're settling. I like that one. So you saw that as a dropping gloves as an attribute. Oh, and it, in the 1990s, absolutely. Did you see them quite tied up? No, no, I, I won't tell you that there is a risk to that, and that's when somebody goes over the glass on him, and then he pounds them, but that's a different story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Rob, Rob, just as a side, he was here, Rob Ray, many years ago, and he, he talked about when he was he'd retired, and they decided to do one year back, and he was playing in Binghamton, you know, uh, just Lord. triple, whatever it was, minor league, and uh, they just played, you know, the, the national anthem, Canadian anthem, and all of a sudden they dropped the puck, and some 20-year-old dropped the gloves, immediately went after this 37-year-old Rob Ray, and he goes, really? <laughs> you really have to do this? And in fact, they did, and he beat the crap out of the 20-year-old, but, you know, they, you know that of was- Of course his, they did. <laughs> that was his reputation, you know, just, you know, one of those those deals. Well, you have an incredible reputation, and I, I can't thank tell you how thrilled I am that you joined us today. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk sports. It's always, it's always fun. Sports and sports law are my favorite topic after my kids. So. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Nellie Drew.